I'd like to first thank Dave uh, with PCI for inviting me here today to give a talk on uh, 10 points to consider when working with your potent compound C CMO. The first point, while sounds very basic, is critical. Start early in the process. Uh, you're, you're probably going to want to do an on-site audit. You're going to want to verify that your potent compound safety CMO has the right engineering controls. Uh, at some point, they're going to have an onboarding process where they're going to want to evaluate their ability to handle your compound safely. And all of this takes time. In addition, what may happen and what often happens is you provide the data. We have our occupational toxicologists review that data, and there might be gaps or it might be a misunderstanding in what your data means. So we may have to come back with you with additional questions. Often, we get requests to do uh, potent compound safety evaluations, setting OELs and setting ADEs and PDEs and the like. And they say, oh, can we have this by Friday? And they give it to us and uh, give us their reports on Wednesday. And if there's any questions, while we can turn things around relatively quickly, if there's any questions, you know, that's just going to delay the process. So that's my first point I'd like to make is start early. The second point I'd like to make is ensure that your safety data sheet is up to date and contains useful information. Often we get material safety data sheets now called SDSs from, uh, <clears throat> from the innovator companies and they essentially contain meaningless data or they have not been updated. They'll have a lot of not available, uh, has not been tested, or they'll just use very generic terms and that is not very helpful for the occupational toxicologist when setting the OEL. So it's important to keep those safety data sheets up to date, have useful and current information. And there's some guidelines uh, that you know are established on how often you should update your safety data sheet. Okay, so that's the second uh, bullet point I'd like to make. Ensure that your safety data sheets contain useful information. Here's another thing that <coughs> kind of irritates, uh, ir irritates us as occupational toxicologists, and we call this OEL shopping. Uh, basically, people will come to us and have us set an OEL, and then th they don't like the number, so they go to another company, have them set an OEL. They don't like that number either, so they just keep shopping around to try to justify a higher OEL. And, you know, as occupational toxicologists, in this profession, we generally consider that if two OELs are within a factor of 10 of each other, those are pretty comparable. OELs, while people don't like to hear this, are not precise numbers. Uh, you know, whenever you see an OEL that's 13 or 12, you know, somebody's not doing it right because they're over and they're indicating the level of preciseness that's really not there. So again, don't go o OEL shopping. What you need to do is look at the report and make sure that the report accurately reflects the hazards of your compound, not uh, just the rely on the numerical number. So that's the third point. Don't go o OEL shopping. All right, be transparent with what you know. This is probably where most of the time we have misunderstandings. They provide limited amount of data. We do a full report and we provide that report to the client, which then provides it to the innovator company. And they come back and say, well, did you consider this? And we say, well, you didn't provide us with that information up front. So now we have to go back through the entire evaluation. If you have things like, you know, mutagenicity data or AIMS test or genotox data or other types of studies, provide that up front. You will save yourself a lot of time. Don't wait to continually just spoon feed the information as the requests come in. It's very important to do that all up front and be transparent with what you know. Understand that lack of data means greater uncertainty. The majority of occupational toxicologists 
use what's called the uncertainty factor method of, of uh, determining OELs and ADEs. Now the problem with that, if we have data gaps, like there is no, maybe there is no gene tox data. You, know, you don't have that available. That's going to create greater uncertainty. Or maybe you only have single dose studies. Again, that's going to create greater uncertainty. The closer you get to human trials or human data, the less uncertainty you're going to have. So make sure that you have adequate data to set an OEL. You can't set an OEL when it's very, very early stage. There's just not enough, not enough data to set a robust and scientifically supportable occupational exposure limit. So uh, six, th uh, six thing, verify that the CMO has valid potent compound safety training, uh, which, you know, this may require that you actually go on site and not only look at the training documentation, but observe how the operators are actually working. I've been at some facilities where their operators have potent compound safety training, but I've observed them using air hoses to blow off powder off the top of a, a container. You know, not acceptable. You know, training's one thing, how they apply it is another. So make sure that your CMO has potent compound safety training and then it's actually being implemented. Then uh, verify that engineering controls are in place and have been validated. You'll want to see the surrogate monitoring results. If it's a credible, potent compound safety, CMO, you'll want to see that they've done surrogate monitoring with you know, compounds like lactose or naproxen sodium, and look at the data and look to see how many iterations they have. It's easy to, to have good numbers if you only did one iteration, but having repeatable studies that are close to each other in uh, airborne exposures is very, very important. So look for repeatable surrogate monitoring studies. And if they change the process, they may have to repeat or uh, do additional surrogate monitoring. So look for that. Eighth, if necessary, partner with the CMO on additional controls. We see this all the time is a, they really like the CMO because their quality programs are where they need to be. They, uh, they like their facility, but they may not have the right piece of equipment. So sometimes if you really like everything else with the CMO, partner and maybe do cost sharing of what that additional piece of equipment may need to be. I mean, we see this often, uh, particularly with big pharma companies. They'll want to use a specific CMO, but they may not have the right size you know, reactor or something. Uh, so they'll partner with the CMO to, to cost share the purchase of that additional equipment. Understand that there are many, many different control banding systems. There's the Merck system, there's your traditional four band system, there's the Affagility uh, five band system, there's the Roche system. I mean, there's many, many systems. We typically deal with about 14 control banding systems on a weekly basis at Affagility Solutions. So there is not necessarily one control band that fits everybody's situation. So make sure you define what your CMO's control banding system is and how your compound fits into their system. Finally, provide an update when more information becomes available. Uh, we see this, they may start off handling a compound as a category 3B, but as they get more data, uh, they might get more human relevant data, then you can actually uh, reduce the uncertainty factors and actually in, uh, the OEL should go up from there or the ADE should go up from there as well. And that way you can possibly lower it to a, a, a lower control band to possibly a category two or maybe a 3A. So that's important as well because then you're going to reduce the cost. In con increased control means increased handling and increased personal protective equipment, increased cost. So with that, I'd like to turn it over to Dave 
and he'll give the next part of the presentation. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dean. Uh, so right now we're going to talk about PCI Pharma System uh, Services, which is basically a, a CMO, which has uh, got numerous operations. So what I want to talk about is going from a new inquiry to onboarding and then to developing and manufacturing of a highly potent molecule. So basically what you've got presented in front of you here is our uh, new product uh, introduction flow diagram. So it goes from neat API to drug product to uh, secondary packaging and the quality aspects of it as well. So what I'm going to look at is this part here. So when a, a new inquiry comes into PCI services, uh, the business development uh, uh, delegate will actually concentrate on obtaining the information from the client. So that might be in the form of an RFI, or it could be in an RFP, uh, or an RFQ. That information is then uh, consolidated into what we call a questionnaire one. So this questionnaire one, uh, with the relevant MSDS and any toxicology information, is then passed back to our uh, quotes team who prepare uh, the proposals for the client. Uh, PCI services follows a very lean uh, way of, uh, of, uh, of processing this. This is what we call our SQDC, which is safety, quality, delivery, and cost. Now I'm going to concentrate on the, the safety aspect for, uh, in terms of this presentation. Uh, so safety is huge uh, for us, especially when you're handling uh, highly potent compounds. So the safety is actually assessed by committee. So it's not any one person. It's actually a group of uh, multidisciplined personnel who will actually assess the, the molecule. And what we tend to look for is uh, items such as the actual molecular structure, the mode of action for the API, the therapeutic area, you know, is it oncology? Uh, any toxicology data that may be present, either pre preclinical, so animal studies, or any human data that they do have. And then we can uh, relate that to the proposed method of manufacture, batch sizes, and the dosage form as well. So from that data, we've uh, got a highly trained team, as Dean was uh, explaining, highly potent uh, team who are trained to actually calculate uh, occupational exposure limits. Again, this is done and performed by a committee. As Dean says, you might have three people assessing the, the molecule in terms of occupational exposure limit, and you may actually have three different answers. So what you want to do is collectively, as a committee, come to uh, some sort of conclusion that you can actually assess, assess the molecule that you may be uh, uh, working on. So from this, the, the, the SQDC is completed. So we look at the, the quality. Is it within our, uh, our licenses that we, at PCI Pharma Services? Can we actually deliver what we want to do to the client? And you know, ultimately, what is the cost uh, uh, for the proposal? So once the project is awarded, there's a second questionnaire that we actually fill in. And now this is a questionnaire we actually fill in as the operations team as well as the, as the client. It's a face-to-face -face communication where we get, can go into much further detail of the proposed scope of work. At this point here, we actually authorize an occupational exposure limit report to be produced by a third-party uh, occupational hygienist such as Affagility. Uh, the only reason that we may not do this, if the, if the client already has an in-house toxicology uh, department and they can provide us with that uh, uh, actual OEL report. So from this, we take the OEL, plus what we do is we perform SMEPAC testing on our equipment. So looking at airborne uh, contamination or airborne concentration from our equipment. Uh, so we take the, the, the OEL, we look at our uh, SMEPAC results, we look at the batch size, the formulation, 
and the end result is we have this process risk analysis performed. So this process exposure will actually give you a real daily intake uh, for the operators that will actually be uh, performing the task. This is not just done in the manufacturing area. Another important part is the laboratories. So we have to make sure that uh, laboratories are doing uh, safe handling of uh, reference standard and weighing out uh, uh, powders. We can also calculate uh, ADE, acceptable daily exposure, and PDE, uh, permitted daily exposures. And we use these uh, internal calculations, uh, or we can request that by occupational hygienist company to calculate uh, cleaning limits for our uh, processing equipment. So we take the ADE or PDE and we actually uh, use the, the um, uh, surface area of the product contact parts and we can come to uh, a cleaning limit. So based, these cleaning limits are based on the toxicology data which is the new uh, enforcement uh, by the EMA, which is coming into effect in December. And then ultimately, we create what we call a potent passport. This potent passport basically describes all the potential safety uh, data that an operator, an analyst, a warehouse staff, any that touches the, the API along its supply chain within our facility will have a document which clearly defines what the potential safety risks are for that uh, API. So once uh, you have got all this information gathered and uh, collated, uh, the, the API information is catalogued. So this is a very good standard and, uh, to be performed. So we actually peer review that, we sign it off, and we put it on uh, our change management system, which is really important for the, the life cycle of the, of the API. Because as you know, we may be starting at clinical phase one, and then as you go along the different clinical phases, more and more data is actually being produced in terms of uh, the safety of toxicology, and that uh, information can then be supplemented back into the already uh, documented uh, information and updates can be provided. So I just want to talk uh, next few minutes on uh, the actual facility where we manufacture highly potent uh, drug products. This is PCI Tradega um, Contained Manufacturing Facility, or CMF for short. This was a blank piece of paper, so we actually designed uh, the facility and the equipment with the equipment uh, suppliers, especially for high potent drug products. Uh, so this is for solid oral drug products, so uh, tablets and capsules. What we've designed with the equipment supplier is a totally enclosed system. There is no open handling of powders whatsoever. So some traditional methods such as wet granulation where the formulator would uh, uh, squeeze the product and have a good feel of uh, the product to assess its suitability goes out the window. So we have to look at different techniques to ensure that we are getting a suitable end product. So we use a lot of uh, uh, technology. We use uh, a lot of PLC driven systems which is uh, displayed on HMI to actually determine then the end point of our, say, our granulation or the drying point of our, uh, of our granulate as well. Uh, the facility has been designed for a, a series of batch sizes from small development, one kilogram batches, to more uh, large scale uh, clinical and small scale commercial of 120 kilograms. Uh, as its own utilities with a, a single pass uh, air HVAC system and it has its own effluent tr treatment plant to assure that the products are uh, suitably uh, disposed of. The facility was designed with uh, the global compliance uh, in mind, so it's suitable for uh, European market, it's suitable for uh, FDA and Visa and the Japanese market as well. It uses the, the highest technology or uh, to, to ensure the cleanability of the equipment as well. So we use a lot of uh, wet, wet in place systems for the very small equipment to ensure that the gross contamination is actually removed. Or we use wash in place systems uh, with uh, wash skids with detergents in there and purified water. 
and we use a, a wash off line for certain pieces of the equipment. So this is an example of the, the, the small development scale which can also be used for um, uh, clinical batches as well. All the equipment is uh, GMP. So we go from very simple excipient dispensing, which is shown in the Hycoflex containment bag. Then this can be taken on to dispense an isolator, where we have uh, uh, two scales that we can uh, weigh out the product and dispense that directly into either a Hycoflex bag or uh, a, a rigid uh, IBC. Then the next slide goes on to a granulation suite, so for wet granulation, fluid bed drying and milling. As you can see here, these are standard processes, but what is different is uh, the product is uh, pneumatically transferred and vacuum transferred going from uh, the wet granulator to the fluid bed through to the, the dry mill into an IBC without any powder being exposed whatsoever. For sampling, people may question, we actually have uh, contained samplers as well where we can actually remove a sample safely and uh, assess that in a, another area, a flexible isolator. Now that product can then be taken on to tablet compression. So we have a, a very, uh, almost like a cassette compression for which is where the turret is, which is running under negative pressure. The tablets again, can be sampled safely using continuous liner, or the tablets, once they are uh, suitable, can go into these Hagflex bags. The tablets can then be uh, coated, film coated, using a, a standard uh, film coating machine with some additional features for containment, such as flexible isolators. Or the other option is that we can actually encapsulate the product, so we can actually take the granules from the granulation suite and feed that into an encapsulation machine again Again, a fairly contained encapsulation machine which is washed in place as well. And then an example of the, the larger scale equipment, which is a 20 to 120 kilogram scale, we've al almost mirrored the exact same process, but at a larger scale. So we looked at geometrically similar processes from the fluid, I mean, the, the high shear granulator and the fluid bed dryer. So going from 15 liters up to 150 liters, going from a, a, an FS90 fluid bed dryer going up to an FS1000 uh, fluid bed dryer. And the products actually still get compressed, compressed or encapsulated into their final dosage forms using the exact same equipment. The tablet coating machine here is slightly different. This is one that we actually worked with the supplier very closely to redesign this, especially for containment. So we can take the, the bags of tablets within these Hycoflex bags, can, uh, put them on top of the, the, the film coater and actually disperse the tablets right into the coating drum without any uh, open processes. A co coating machine by principle is running under negative pressure so it gets rid of any potential dust. And to remove the tablets out of the machine, we actually engineered with the supplier again Instead of the drum rotating clockwise, it rota rotates anti-clockwise with specialized baffles and the tablets can uh, be uh, extracted into suitable containers. And now just for PCI's uh, Tradiga site, the latest investment is a Gertai's roller compactor. So following the exact same philosophy as the wet granulation and the CMF equipment, we have a roller compactor here, which is contained within an isolator. So again, we use rigid IBCs to uh, disperse the granule or powder into the roll compactor. And at the bottom of the roll compactor, we collect uh, um, uh, the resulting granules. Again, it's a PS P PLC driven uh, computerized systems, which, you can, uh, uh, which have feedback loops to ensure that the product, even if it's going out of its specification slightly, it brings it back in. And this is also washed in place as well.